Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 556.com. And it's uh, Everyday Carry, Police Citizens and Police Citizen Encounters. Uh, good evening. My name is Matt Kilgo. I'll be one of your hosts tonight. I am an attorney. Uh, you can find me at georgiagunlawyers.com. You can find me on Facebook at Georgia Gun Lawyers. Uh, tonight, we also have with us our producer, Mariana Wegener, who is a huge gun enthusiast, best shot in the group. We have Lana Four Brian, who is the regional director for U.S. Law Shield. That's in, here in Georgia and in South Carolina. We have Mike Banja. I'll let Mike describe to you a, a little bit about what he does. He is a police officer, uh, almost 20 years experience, who works for a very large municipal police agency. I, I won't say which one, but it rhymes with Smetlanta. <laughs> and uh, that's, I love doing that. And we have Jesse Fox who is a firearms instructor with, and he owns and runs a women protection services. Jesse's down in Florida. So he's joining us from Florida. Mike's up in Gwinnett County. I'm in Marietta. Lana's way down in Savannah and Mariana's over in uh, West Co or East Cobb. So uh, we're joining you from different places. We want to talk about everyday carry tonight and we want to talk about police citizen encounters. Now, when we talk about everyday carry, what we're talking about are not just the firearms that you carry every day, but all the other things that you carry. What are the practical considerations when you go out into public, especially these days, number one, potentially as a new gun owner and also under the threat of a pandemic? What are you carrying? Where are you carrying it? Is it lawful and safe to do so? And how do you use it should the need arise? So let's just for a couple of minutes here, I, I want Mike and Jesse to introduce each other. Uh, not each other, but I want them to introduce themselves to you. So Mike, why don't you get started? Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do and tell us about your everyday carry. Ah, okay. So my name is Mike Banja and um, my agency graciously allows us to do things like this, but when I do these, I'm not representing my agency. Uh, this is just me and 18 years of experience with a very, very large police department in the southeast United States. Uh, I've spent nine years on the street and nine years assigned to the training academy, both in the uh, legal section and in the uh, firearms training unit. I currently have a, a wonderful assignment with a good team of guys at a big place where Normally it's very busy and uh, lately it's been kind of slow. I'm at the airport. So that's uh, that's my current assignment. As far as what I carry every day, I guess the, the big uh, distinction there is whether I'm at work or whether I'm at home or on the softball field uh, with my daughter or out walking around in public with the kids. Uh, at work, of course, I have the mindset of fighting my way into a problem. Uh, so heavy armor, soft armor, pistols, additional magazines, uh, rifle with uh, hopefully more ammo than Custer, uh, and a ton of medical. So four tourniquets, uh, four packs of chest seals, uh, everything that you'd need to patch yourself up and uh, possibly one other person. Now, when I'm off work, it's very different. Um, I've got a five shot J frame revolver in my front right pocket. And I still have uh, hyphen vents and tourniquets. And uh, I'm sure Alana will talk a lot about Law Shield, but uh, if you're a Law Shield member and you're looking for some good medical stuff that has been tested and some good training, uh, we've got both. But uh, I think one of the most underestimated, and, I, and I'm sure Jesse will get into his, is. Uh, the idea that if you're going to engage in a gunfight, as in you're in a defensive shooting and someone else is shooting back at you, uh, you need to have the ability to patch gunshot wounds, um, both in terms of tourniquets, uh, femoral and brachial arms and legs, and uh, hyphen seal. Because with the idea that someone's shooting back at you, uh, there is a potential of you getting shot. And unfortunately, the time it takes for the ambulance to get to you is about the time it takes a human being to bleed out. Uh, so with that, that's who I am, and that's what I carry every, into the world, every day into the world, along with a uh, tiny little flashlight and insulin. Uh, so, Jesse. 
All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Jesse Fox. I'm the chief instructor with Women Protection Services. Uh, first, I'll tell you a little bit about me and what I do, and then I'll tell you about uh, what I carry, and I'll kind of hop on to some things that Mike talked about as well. Um, so I've been teaching concealed carry classes all over the country for 10 years now. Uh, now I've brought my class online because of the group restrictions. So uh, I'm super excited to be with everybody today. I want to thank Matt and Mariana and Lana and Mike for being here with me and inviting me on here. Um, so that's a little bit about me and my experience teaching. Um, as far as what I carry, I, I got to agree with Mike. Um, it really depends on what I'm doing or where I'm going or what I'm wearing. But for the most part, it's going to be some form of a, a Glock um, because that is what I'm most familiar with. That's what I have the most time behind. Uh, and that, that's what I'm carrying right now. So um, it might be a full-size Glock if we're talking about home defense. It might be a compact Glock, like a Glock 19 when it comes to everyday carry that I can fit in a holster. Um, but it, when it comes to training with it, I, I feel comfortable because everything works the same when I go from gun to gun. I also want to kind of piggyback on what Mike's mentioned about when we're carrying every day, uh, our education and knowing not just how to shoot a piece of paper at a gun range, right? It's knowing how to how to pack a wound. It's having that gunshot wound education. Uh, if you see this red thing right up here on my shelf, that's actually what this is, um, is a gunshot wound kit. It's got all my medical in it. Um, that is what I take when I go on the range, just in case someone gets shot or if I'm out uh, in public, it's something I keep in my car as well. So um, I got mine through U.S. Law Shield uh, after taking their gunshot wound class. So highly recommend educating and training and practicing because uh, that's when you're going to feel the most comfortable. Is The more time you have practicing, the more comfortable you'll feel, the more confident you'll feel. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks both of you guys for, for jumping in on that. Uh, and what I hear you both saying is what you carry every day depends on different circumstances. Obviously, from Mike's perspective, when he's going out to work to catch bad guys or prevent bad guys from doing bad things, he's going to carry something completely different. He's carrying rifles, as he said, a lot more ammo than Custer. Hopefully, he's got a better plan than Custer did. Uh, that it's probably been long enough that we can make jokes about that. Probably shouldn't, but there you go. Uh, and he's fighting into a situation, a scenario. When he's at home, when he's with his family, he's fighting out of a scenario. So Jesse, when you teach your classes, what are some of the most basic things that you impart to your students about just everyday carry? Are you talking about the ways that you carry, how you carry, how many rounds you carry? What, what kind of stuff are you guys talking about? Oh, great question. Uh, we talk about all the above, right? Um, one of the big things I recommend is a lot of people think they get their permit, they get their gun, they get their holster, they're just going to start carrying out in public. Um, right now is a great time to have a holster at home uh, and be practicing drawing it. Uh, please, I do want to highly recommend doing that with an empty gun. Um, I shouldn't have to say that, but unfortunately, common sense isn't common. So please make sure you're practicing doing that with an empty gun. Uh, so it comes to making sure that when you have to do it, it's not something you think about. It's just your natural reaction. Um, it's, you know, you hear that term muscle memory where uh, I've practiced doing the hackathon rip thousands and thousands of times, right? So I know exactly how I'm gonna pull out the firearm in self-defense um, where I don't have to think about it. So it's, it's preparing ourselves to actually pull it at full speed so we, we go through the motions at home, we practice with an empty gun, we get our holster, we break in our holster, we make sure it's the holster that we actually like and we can get to the gun because I see that a lot in classes where uh, I have people where they bought a holster and they get it home and they can't really get to it as well as they thought they would so then they have to buy something else. So uh, the first aspect we talk about is holster and practicing getting to the gun and making sure it's something that you're comfortable with. And then when you mentioned uh, how many rounds you carry, uh, I always carry a spare magazine for sure. Uh, we say two is one, one is none. That's a, a common saying we have. Uh, so I always make sure I carry a spare magazine. Um, so there may be an instance where one shot is enough. There may be an instance where five shots is not enough. Uh, I, I would be sure that Mike per probably carries a little uh, speed loader, uh, extra yes. ammunition with him when he's yes. carrying that day frame. Uh, so 
And then when you're traveling with a gun, you have to know that your round count is going to be legal in whatever state you're going into. For example, I can't carry my Glock 17 in Colorado because it has a 17 round magazine and they have a 15 round magazine limit. So that's the thing I also have to educate them on. That's all very smart and very true. Uh, you teach in a lot of different states. I know you live in Florida. You teach extensively in Georgia. You teach in South Carolina, Alabama, Colorado. I know you've been to Wisconsin. You've really been all over the U.S. teaching, right? Yeah, yeah. I've taught. I currently teach in eight different states. Uh, I've been individually certified by the NRA, by the state of Mississippi, by the state of North Carolina, by the state of Utah. Uh, so yeah, I've gone out to those different states. I've gone through their curriculum, taken their class. So. Uh, yeah, I've been certified in several different states, so that means I have to know the law in each state as well. That's absolutely correct. You know, uh, the majority of our watchers and listeners are here in Georgia, and, and thankfully, I'll say, just like I said last week, we live in one of the best states in the United States for carry because we have so few restrictions. There are restrictions. There are both state and federal restrictions, but as far as rounds for instance we're not really restricted in the types of rounds that we can carry we can't carry armor piercing rounds but that's a federal law and plus those are kind of hard to fit into a glock uh <laughs> we uh there there are no magazine restrictions uh you know uh, five rounds 15 rounds doesn't matter what size your magazine is doesn't matter how many weapon, uh how many bullets you have in your magazine some states like new jersey you've got more than 10 rounds and that's a felony uh california is the same way Colorado and Lana jump in on this you used to live in Colorado and, and are a transplant now to Georgia tell us about Colorado's rules on magazines and ammo so it's the 15 round magazine it's a permit so Colorado is an open carry state so open carry meaning you don't have to have a permit in order to carry your firearm so you can carry it open anywhere you'd like to, unless of course, you know, federal buildings, courthouses, et cetera, same federal laws apply there. Um, but you have to take a class, it is a required class, it's a classroom, that's why Jesse teaches in Colorado. It's a required class that you have to take, and then you take that, per that certificate to the sheriff's office, because the individual sheriffs in all 64 counties in Colorado, they own the permits. So if you live in Jefferson County or you live in El Paso County, wherever you live, you actually have to take that certificate to the sheriff's office and they're the ones who issue your permit. Whereas when I came to Georgia and met you, and I'm, you know, as an NRA instructor myself, I thought that was awesome that Georgia does not require classes. However, that's why I asked Jesse, I said, there's a market in Georgia that you have to come to because these women and men absolutely have to know what you teach. He's probably one of the best instructors I have ever listened to. And because of that, it's important that you know the ins and outs of everyday mm -hmm. carry. If not, you're actually going out blind. You don't have you know, that, that, that thought. You have to have this type of, of class Jesse puts on an amazing class. Well, and, and he does. I've actually been to his classes and he's he's fantastic at what he does. And and your comments are a good counterpoint to what we have in Georgia. We don't have round restrictions. We don't have magazine restrictions, which means that uh, we have a lot more options in how we choose to protect ourselves both inside our home and when we carry outside of our home. What what it sounds like you're telling me is that anyone can carry openly in Colorado, but for to carry concealed, you have to have a permit. Is that right? Absolutely. So okay. this is the constitutional argument, right, is when the weather changes in 15 minutes, now you're going to make me have to get a permit to put in my wallet because I put my jacket on. Mm -hmm. So well, and automatically, yeah. that's what it is. Georgia is so much better you know we you don't have to have a weapons carry license in your home in your car or in your place of business so long as you qualify uh, to possess a firearm meaning you're uh, over the age of 21 or well, it'd be 18 for handguns uh, well technically you'd have to be eligible for a weapons carry license under certain circumstances as well but no felony convictions no misdemeanor crimes of domestic violence you're not a first offender probationer in other words, if you're lawful to possess a handgun, you do not need a weapons carry license inside your home, inside your car, inside your place of business, 
on property that you own or that you lease or when it's enclosed in a case and unloaded. Now, if it ain't loaded, it don't shoot, as I've heard many people say, and I myself have said from time to time. Um, but that does leave us much more free to carry pretty much any way that we want to, particularly if we have a weapons carry license in Georgia. So let's talk for a couple of minutes about choosing the right firearm, choosing the right type of ammo. And I want to loop Mariana in on this. She's probably our, one of our most enthusiastic shooters, but she's our newest shooter in the group. And I know that Mariana carries several different types of handguns, just depending on the time of day, depending on where she's going, what she's doing. Tell us a little bit about your loadout, Mariana, what you carry and why you carry that specifically. Oh, uh, well, for me, it's all about what matches my outfit. Um, no, not really. Actually, as far as what I carry, it's really just um, one one regular pistol that I carry, and um, it was a gift. And so my uh, everyday carry is a little, I don't know if you can see it. It's a little SIG that's 238. Un that's unloaded, by the way. It is unloaded. Thank you. And, um, and uh, it's, a, I don't know, I like it because I am only 5'2" she's about that tall and uh and so it's a small pistol that fits my body well and i can conceal it no matter what i'm wearing is it, so it's nine millimeter no this one's a 380 because a guy bought it for me and he thinks i wanted a 380 oh you said it was a is that a, a 238 and not a 938 right correct so it's the sig 238 okay, okay so maybe this is a good time to bring back in mike and jesse when we talk about 380 and we talk about nine millimeter, there's a lot of people who don't know the difference between those. And, and I'll be the first one to tell you, and I have to apologize to my wife. I did the same thing. When I went out five or six years ago, bought a Glock nine millimeter pistol, bought a Glock 19, which is back there is the one I carry every day. I also bought a Glock 42, which is a 380. It's a small, it's a subcompact, looked exactly alike. And I said to myself and to the guy who, who happily sold them both to me, so, well, you know, I'll carry the nine millimeter. I'm sure my wife would be more uh, comfortable with the 380, which is a third the size. She's a much better shot than I am. She's a much better shot with a nine millimeter. She's a much better shot with anything you put in her hands. And so I realized the first time we went to the range, what a mistake I had made. So I, I traded that 380 for an M1 carbine and at least myself and my 10 year old have been much happier since then. Uh, so, my, I, I hear you chuckling about that. You've seen my kid shoot. You know how good he is. Tell us, tell us a little bit about the difference in those types of calibers. Can you talk about, you know, plus P and how important caliber selection is? Tell us a little bit about what you know. Yeah. Uh, so I've I've had the luxury of of being sent to several classes and ballistics tests and this sort of thing. Uh, generally speaking uh whoever gets shot in the face first loses uh so it doesn't matter what you're carrying um but you have to be able to operate that weapon system with that ammunition in, in a way that that's gonna bring about a win uh we see 380 being marketed across the country as as a wonderful light thing to go in a smaller frame pistol uh and you can kind of reverse engineer that from the guts of the pistol. Uh, a smaller, lighter pistol does not have the internal engineering to handle the recoil of nine millimeter or 40 caliber rounds. So they have to kind of come up with something with a little bit less oomph behind it. And here we get 380. And that goes back almost a hundred years ago uh, as to where we're talking about nine millimeter Makarov and, and you know, the, the Walther, uh 380s from you know the james bond era uh so PBKRs. what matters what matters is first and foremost uh what gun you got because a gun is better than no gun uh as far as ammunition goes if it's just ball ammunition meaning a piece of lead with a jacket around it or no jacket at all then it's going to make one hole uh, what we generally want when we're talking about offense or offensive or defensive ammunition, people and not paper, is stuff that's going to fragment, 
and cause what we call multiple wound channels. So this is where we get into hollow point or what Matt loves to call cop killer bullets. I feel, I feel unsafe saying that, but uh, any type of jacketed hollow point round is gonna cause a lot of damage to your adversary. And damage equals blood loss equals changing their mind and removing the physical ability to stop. Uh, so what do I carry? I carry what the city gives me. Uh, that's a great answer. Um, but what do I carry if I was purchasing a pistol out there? The, a number of great jacketed hollow point rounds are commercially available. Uh, and you want to make sure that they work in your gun. Matt mentioned plus P. If you've got uh, plus P ammunition, that basically means that it's got a little bit more behind it, and the frame of your pistol might not be able to uh, to deal with that. I've had uh, parts of guns break in my hands because they were not built to carry that type of ammunition. I won't mention specific brand names, uh, but I've had it happen to me on two occasions where shooting something that was a little bit hot resulted in internal damage that completely disabled that firearm. Um, now, but, some firearms are built to use that type of ammunition now, right? Absolutely. absolutely. And, and most modern firearms, uh, plastic guns, are going to eat that stuff up. Uh, the stuff that I would stay away from, and we have a lot of new gun owners over the past month, uh, which I think we're all in favor of. Uh, you know, if, if there's a couple positives that the last months have brought us, it's that more people have kind of stopped and thought about, hey, you know what, maybe my attitude on guns for the past however many years hasn't been right. Uh, maybe I'm changing my tune a little bit. Now, hopefully, they'll seek out the training and education that they need. Uh, one thing that I think we should all pay attention to when we're giving new shooters advice is not only talking about guns, but also talking about that ammo. Because it, it just like it, uh, at the supermarket, if it's the only thing left on the shelf that nobody else has bought, there's probably a reason for that. And I've been to the range a couple of times recently, a couple different ranges, and what's left on the shelf? Steel case ammo. And there's a reason for that. Uh, so It's pretty corrosive. It's not just corrosive. Well, it can be. I man, that stuff that stuff will eat up extractors uh, very quickly. Um, I've seen evidence of that myself, um, working as the armor for a department with 1,800 guns. That stuff, uh, the uh, countries that manufacture it don't even shoot it in their military weapons. There's there's a reason. Uh, well, I, I, I give me. I, I see. I see your point, and Jesse's shaking his head quite a bit. Uh, let me throw that over to you, Jesse. You know, yeah. we talk a lot. When we go to the range, we use full metal jacket, which means you've got a, a, a full metal uh, casing. You've got a some sort of green tip ammo if you're running like a 5.56 or a ball ammunition that you're practicing with. But you, you hear people say when the time comes, Go to boat tail hollow points or uh, boat tail jacketed ammo or uh, so we talk about using something different in a firearm when we're carrying it to protect ourselves what do you tell your classes uh why well, i said so the same thing that mike says uh we definitely want to make sure we're using hollow points for self-defense um like he was mentioning ballistics and penetration uh, when it comes to a hollow point a hollow point is going to penetrate a lot less than a full metal jacket as well uh, so you're going to see less over penetration as as meaning it goes through the person and can potentially hit someone behind them. Uh, um, so you're going to see less ricochets. Right. So um, I know I think it was New York City. They used to use what's called expanding full metal jackets until they actually started doing studies where their expanding full metal jackets still weren't expanding enough and resulting in over penetration and ricochets. Uh, so. Uh, we definitely want to make sure we're carrying a hollow point uh, when we're using it for self-defense. Obviously, they're a lot more expensive, so that's not what we're going to be going through at the range a whole lot. But as he, I'll, again, I'll, I'll second what Mike said. You want to run a box of your self-defense ammo through your gun. You want to make sure, A, it works, and B, you know how it feels. Because you don't want to pull it in self-defense and be like, I don't know what this is going to do in my gun, right? You, you don't want that. 
Um, so you want to have that confidence knowing it works in your gun. You want to have that confidence knowing how it feels in your gun. So yes, we do we do hollow points. Um, I typically recommend to my students like Hornady Critical Defense or Hornady Critical Duty. Um, for example, there was actually, I'll give you a quick uh, little legal case for you real quick, happened in New Jersey. Um, New Jersey, you're not allowed to use hollow point ammunition. So the Hornady Critical Defense technically doesn't have a hollow point. Uh, there was a security guard who was arrested. Well, they, it wasn't technically hollow point ammunition. It was a false arrest. So um, these are also things you have to know when you're carrying your ammunition and when you're going into different states too. That happened just a couple of weeks ago, and it's actually a lawyer that I know and that Lana knows very well, Evan Knappen, who's a U.S. law show lawyer like I am, who represented that fella. And I texted Evan uh, maybe a week or week and a half ago and said, hey, what happened and, and what can you tell me? What will your client allow you to tell me? And, and he just wrote back, everything went great. Check this website. Check this news article. You get everything you need right out of that. Uh, I, I, I I absolutely agree with what both of you are saying. You guys have much more experience and training than I probably will ever have. Um, but this is the same stuff that I've been taught. If you you know, use what you train with and train what you use, you, you need to take a box of that hollow point ammo to the range with you at least once a month or however often that you practice to know how to use it, to know if, it, if it's different in any way, shape, form or fashion than the Winchester white box stuff that you're practicing with. Uh, and, and especially when you go into your home, your load's gonna be different. Uh, I, I have a 10 year old and a 14 year old. I don't want the, the bullet that, that I use to shoot the bad guy to go through him and through the wall and hit one of them or to hit my wife. So that's the, the difference between using a jacketed hollow point versus uh, a full metal jacket type of ammo. So I think that's great. Uh, that's that's great advice. We, we're talking a little bit about caliber. We've talked a little bit about the, the type of uh, the type of bullet. Let's talk about where you carry. I want to throw this over to Lana and to Mariana because they are going to have a different perspective, perhaps, than the three of us about where they carry. There's so much in firearms training about carrying in a purse or carrying on your body. Uh, Jesse, you might have something to add to that too. Lana, tell us a little bit of what you think about carrying on your purse, in, on your body, where, what type of, because you're an NRA, former NRA instructor yourself, correct? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, What type of info do you, do you like to share? Well, women, I, I wrote an entire curriculum on this. It, it's about women and how we carry. Women carry totally different than men. Men can carry in the same place, no matter what they're wearing, every single day. I always make that, you know, joke that my husband gets up in the morning, you know, shakes himself, scratches his head, and he's ready for the day. Women, we have to do so much more, right? We have to think about what we're going to wear, where we're going, how we're going to wear it. Is it on our persons? Is it in our purse? Are you a purse carrier? Are you not? Um, are you hiking? Well, if you're hiking, how are you going to carry? Is it going to be in your yoga pants? Well, is there any holster that's going to hold in yoga pants? I mean, these are all things you have to think about. Um, so women, we have it a little bit hard, but I did write an entire curriculum and taught that class of women and how we carry. So it just depends on the person, just like a gun is very personal. Mariana, what do you think? Yeah, I agree, Lana. It's um for women and how we carry, there's a lot of information. It seems like a lot of the holsters on the market really are better designed for men and how men carry with belts or pants on every day. I know I'm a skirt or dresses kind of person, so it doesn't, you know, figuring out a comfortable way to carry that was also functional and easy to access in the event I needed to use my weapon defensively. You know, it took some tinkering and trying different options, and that's what I would recommend to any other woman who's interested in starting to carry on a regular basis is you're gonna have to try on a few different things to see what works for you. There's not, you know, there's not one solution that everyone loves. My personal choice is often, um, Jesse actually kind of pokes fun of it in his uh, women's classes. It's, uh, it's not the most popular choice. And so I use the flashbang holster, which actually goes, you know, it's a bra carry. And, uh, you know, not a lot of women like that, but it's my, it's my go-to. I find it very comfortable and accessible and out of the way. So I personally like to carry on my persons. So 
I do carry on on me. And the reason why is I do not like carrying in a purse. Um, I'm a very forgetful person. So if I leave my purse, you know, behind the bathroom stall and I walk out of a store or a restaurant, that's something I would do. Um, so I don't like carrying in my purse, but that's me. There are several people I know that don't, that, you know, their purse is an extra body part. Therefore, they never forget their purse. Well, then that would be a great idea. Um, make sure it's in a compartment all by itself. Don't put another lipstick or, or some kind of mirror in, in the way. Because if you and have to shoot through your purse, holstered, you holstered in something secure, total oh, trigger right. coverage, Kydex. I, I don't feel comfortable carrying off my body at all. Um, I don't know, little hands can get into just about anything and I like to know exactly where it is at all times. I mean, Jesse, you're asked this question all the time, aren't you, Jesse? I mean, all the time in your classes, you teach hundreds of women every single week. Um, what do they tell you or what do you tell them? Well, yeah, I mean, I kind of lean, it's, it's my saying is out of sight, out of mind, right? Um, like whether you're forgetful or not, um, a lot of women have habits. They have things they've always done with their purse. Uh, I'll give you an example. It's not a, exactly a, a fun story, but uh, there was a woman in Wisconsin. She was new to concealed carry, but her habit, she always put the purse in the back seat when she got in the car. That was just what she always did. Well, she forgot the gun was in the purse, right? Forgetful about that portion of it. Uh, and then the little kid was able to get to the firearm um, while she was in the back or while she was driving the vehicle. Um, so yeah, uh, there's a lady in Colorado, Con uh, not, a, not a kid issue, but she forgot the gun was in her purse. She put it on the screener at the airport. It cost her $3,800 in fines. She got arrested. She missed her flight. Um, so that's what I, that's kind of what I tell people about off body carry is it's typically out of sight, out of mind. You'll forget that it's in there. Um, that's how TSA finds anywhere from 70 to over a hundred guns per week in carry ons is because people forget it was in there. So many of my clients come from that exact scenario. I've, you know, probably 30 individuals that I've uh, represented in the past five years who literally just forgot that their firearm was there in the bag. And in Atlanta, Atlanta takes more firearms through uh, out of, off of people's hands and security than, than any other location because we have so much uh, so much heavy foot traffic through the through the airport. Uh, in Atlanta, there's a difference in how you're treated depending on whether you have a weapons carry license or not. Formerly. Uh, and we have we do have what's called a right of retreat for some government buildings in, in in Georgia. If you have a weapons carry license, but you leave or attempt to leave as soon as you're notified that you failed to clear security because you're possess you're in possession of a firearm, the law says you cannot be convicted of a possession offense. Now it says cannot be convicted, and I tell my classes all the time that does not mean you cannot be arrested. Historically, what the Atlanta airport did and what guys that Mike knows through the TSA and the federal guys and the Atlanta airport police, what those guys would do is if you had a weapons carry license, they'd turn you away, they'd let you go back to your uh, car, secure the firearm, and then travel and go on about your business. About four years ago, the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, for the Northern District of Georgia got involved and said, hey, guess what? Even though Georgia has a right of retreat, the federal law does not. So here's how it's going to work. If you have a weapons carry license and you're in possession of a firearm as you go through security, you won't be arrested, but you will be given a federal citation and summons to appear in federal court. You'll have to answer some questions, at least with the Atlanta police and probably with the TSA and potentially with the FBI. And then you'll be given a, a court date in federal court to appear to answer a firearms charge. Uh, if you don't have a weapons carry, do what, what might? Don't forget the civil suit, the civil fire. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's for people who have a weapons carry license. If you don't have a weapons carry license, then you're arrested. You're taken to the Clayton County Jail because that portion of the airport's in Clayton County. And the uh, magistrate court judge I know for years had uh, had a process where they wouldn't let you out for at least 24 hours if you're caught in the airport with a gun, which means you're definitely going to miss your flight. And Mike's absolutely right. Whether you get it worked out in state court of Clayton County, and they will not give you a firearm back. I've I've been through that merry-go-round many, many times with them. Or you get arrested or, or you get cited and sent to federal court. 
separate and apart from the criminal case, three to six months later, the, the TSA is going to come to you. They're going to send you a letter and they're going to say, hey, remember that time you came through the airport with a gun? I want you to give us $4,200 in fines. I think that's what their current, their cap is now. It's gone up over the past five years. It started out, I think, at $2,500. Now it's almost to $4,500. So you have to deal with, there are consequences. And I, I make sure to, to tell people all the time and stress there are consequences to every place that you carry. Carry because you want to protect yourself. Know how you're carrying, know how to use what you're carrying, and know where you can and cannot carry. One of the handouts that I've connected to our webinar tonight is a list of the most basic carry laws in Georgia. It's how you get your weapons carry license, where you can carry with or without it, uh, and, and some basic restrictions. With a weapons carry license in Georgia, you can carry it virtually anywhere. Uh, public, you can carry the grocery store, the movie theater, the bank, which are that's a little tricky. A bar, that's right. We're, we're not restricted in Georgia. We don't have any of the uh, 30-06 rules as like Texas I calls it a 30-06 rule. Yeah, sure. I have a, I have a question. Now sure. that we're half of this society is wearing masks, and this is very prevalent for what we're talking about, Half the world is wearing masks. The other half is saying masks don't help. Because of that, and you walk into a bank, mm -hmm. Mike uh, it's, it, it, it's a joke, but it's serious. You know, uh, there's a, it's a felony to wear a mask in public in Georgia, isn't it, Mike? Yeah, it, and that law goes back to, um, I believe, the late 1950s, where they were trying to discourage the Ku Klux Klan from meeting. So they criminalized the wearing of max masks in Georgia. Uh, very recently, the mayor of the city of Atlanta asked the attorney general to issue a, you know, hey, look, wearing masks is okay during this mess. Uh, and the attorney general agreed. He said no cases would be prosecuted for this, uh, for the wearing of mask laws during the pandemic event. Uh, generally speaking, and I, and I, I think we'd all, uh, both Lana and Jesse would, would add to this, more so than appearance, uh, the things that we're looking in terms of threat perception and situational awareness is body language um, and that that little thing that's inside of us that crawls up on our shoulder and says, hey, watch that. That's not normal. Uh, so not so much the wearing of a mask in a bank is is going to scare me because, again, half people have it, half people don't. It's the things that I see where you know someone's getting out of a uh, you know car and not only are they putting on their mask but they're pulling their hoodie up so that only their eyes are visible you know they're shifting around with something in their waistband that's the moment where it's mm, not good uh so body language and, and kind of being an observer and a student of body language is i think more important now that people's faces are concealed more so than they used to be um and and, and what do you think about that jesse what what do you what advice do you give to to persons who are just starting to take responsibility for defending themselves in public in terms of of reading people and detecting armed persons things like that uh so the, the thing i like to say is what most people walk around in public at what we call threat level white right like they don't think anything's going to happen they're buried in their phone they're not paying attention what i tell people as a concealed concealed carry holder is you really should be walking around at threat level yellow. You sh you're not you're not paranoid. You're prepared, right? Um, you are checking out people around you. You're not buried in your phone. Um, you're you're keeping your eyes up. You're watching for that body language. You're watching for them reaching. Uh, I've actually I've actually caught someone that way that kept reaching into their um, into their coat. I was helping a buddy with security at a at a bar in Milwaukee, and I was like, Hey, bud, I don't I don't like the way he keeps reaching into his coat like that because we were closing up. And um, sure enough, got him outside. The guy had a gun, um, and it was all just because of that that situational awareness that I wasn't um, absent-minded. I, I was, you know, don't get complacent when you're carrying a firearm every day. Uh, obviously, I can feel that piece of steel on my hip, but I also am aware. And I'm, I'm mentally prepared. It's not just physically having the firearm. It's mentally being aware and, and being prepared for what I would do if something were to happen um, and, and knowing what I would do. And that's fantastic. That's fantastic. 
Okay. Hey, very briefly on that, we've, we've got a, uh, I'm sure many of the people who are listening to us right now are, are people who are in, in Georgia and, and I imagine a wide body of instructors, at least the ones that I've talked to, they're tuning in. In terms of, of educating our friends and our students and our family members, we have a luxury uh, today that we haven't had in the past. Uh, I can take a class full of police recruits and I can pull up YouTube and I can say, hey, we're going to watch pictures of 20 dudes robbing banks or watch videos of 20 dudes about to rob a place uh, and watch the body language of these guys. Watch, watch what motions their hands make. Uh, watch the way that they're looking and what they're looking at prior to committing a crime. So we've got we've got tools out there to educate uh, particularly new gun owners or people who are later in life starting to take responsibility for themselves uh, that we've never had before. So, you know he's serious, folks. He took off his glasses. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that, let's, uh, admittedly, let's getting older. I, you know, some things. Let's move over sort of a hand in hand with carrying is, is knowing where and how and, and how to respond both to the public and to police if someone sees you carrying in a store. I am positive that the guy behind me at the Xfinity counter today, he was actually to the side. I didn't like the looks of him, so I, I didn't want him to my back, but I was watching him the whole time. I'm positive today that he saw uh, the outline, the imprint of my Glock in my waistband and he did not like it. And he took a few steps back and he stood towards the back of the back of the building and, and, and wouldn't come any closer to me. Maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. Uh, let's talk for a few minutes, especially with Mike and you know, with Jesse and, and, and Lana and Mariana, all of us about situations in public when someone sees your gun, how do you react? And what happens when a police officer approaches you and says, sir, ma'am, do you have a firearm? Mike? Uh, so to get into that, we've, we've got to spend a very brief amount of time talking about uh, just encounters with cops in general. And the way that the United States Supreme Court likes to divide them up is that there are only three. Every category between a law enforcement officer and a United States citizen or a person on United States soil gets put into one of three different buckets. Uh, the first bucket is a normal consensual encounter where either party can leave if they want to. Uh, so if someone walks up to me and I'm at work and they say, hey, officer, I'd really like to stand here and read this book to you. I could just say, I, I got to go and walk away. Uh, there's nothing, there's no duty or, or requirement that I stay there. Uh, if I walk up to someone and say, hey, I don't know you at all. I don't really know that you're doing anything wrong. Uh, would you mind confessing to any crimes that you have ever committed? they're probably going to say no and they're going to walk away from me. Um, and I can't stop them because we're in that tier one, that consensual encounter. Uh, then we have all the way at the top and we'll fill in the middle in just a second, but all the way at the top is, is what we call probable cause. Uh, the requirement that an officer be able to explain to any reasonable person out there the set of facts that they saw you do and they would agree that a crime was committed. And if you've got that, an officer is just gonna arrest you. And of course, if they're gonna ask you any questions after you've been arrested, then Miranda kicks in and all that wonderful stuff. And most of the time in the United States of America, at least in Georgia, cops don't Mirandize people after we arrest them because we've already gotten everything we needed to make an arrest. Uh, it's only for severe cases, felonies, uh, in cases that could go either way, such as a defensive shooting, that we're gonna start collecting statements that might involve Miranda. We'll talk about that later. But the middle ground, this second type of encounter is one where an officer has the ability to detain you based on the belief that you are armed and dangerous or based on their belief that a crime might be happening. It's not an arrest, it's a temporary interruption of your freedom for the officer to confirm or dispel anything that's going on. And this is where a bunch of persons who get stopped in public carrying a firearm fall in terms of categories. Uh, so how does this start? It usually starts with someone over at Walmart carrying a handgun in their waistband. They bend over to pick up some dog food. 
uh, and then all of a sudden someone from the uh, People's Republic of New York sees this and uh, screams out, oh my God, there's a gun. They run out of Walmart screaming, calling 911. What do they say to 911? Guy with a gun, guy with a gun. And they're excited and they're hysterical. Uh, and it's it's very difficult for, for 911 call takers to interpret just how serious an issue is. So you've got someone from New York screaming, they've got a gun, they've got a gun. It sounds like they're doing something horrible where in fact, it's just a person with a gun in a holster under their shirt. Nevertheless, the cops are coming and the cops are just being told guy with a gun at Walmart. So cops show up expecting Rambo dual wielding M249s and they just get mad. Uh, so what do you expect? It, it, wasn't, it wasn't a cop. It was a Department of Natural Resources conservation ranger. We used to call him that. Now we call him game wardens. And he was guarding the entrance to a parking lot yeah. and demanded that I tell him where I had parked because you're not allowed to park on the side of the road. And I told him I'd park lawfully, but he didn't like that answer. And that's <laughs> when he said, sir, it is a criminal offense to refuse to answer my questions. Now, what happens in that scenario, Mike? Well, let, let me just ask, do you have Hunter Shield? Well, I didn't have a pistol with me at the time because I was on Corps of Engineer property. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Yeah, all right, that's forgivable, I guess. Uh, so he, he challenged you on whether or not you knew the law? He walked, well, he didn't, he didn't, okay. obviously, you don't know who I am. No, no, no. Yeah. So we're walking up and he had already told us, I'd already had a less than stellar interaction with him because we pulled up, they obviously had the parking lot blocked off. And, and my wife rolls down the window. This happened last Saturday at Red Top Mountain, by the way. My mm -hmm. wife rolls down the window and says, uh, he says, you can't park here. She says, well, uh, I, we understand that. And I just said, sir, can you tell us where we can park? No, you just can't park here. And, and I'm like, okay, you're a jerk. And we, you know, we drove off and we parked a mile away. It was the four of us, my, my two sons, my wife, myself. And then we walked to that trailhead and he's still there when we get there. Well, we parked in a parking lot and walk the mile to get to that trailhead. And when we get there, he goes, did you park on the road? And I kind of looked at him, he goes, you need to tell me if you parked on the road or a parking lot. And, and I, I'd already had it with this dude. And, and I just, I walked past him. He's like, sir, you have to answer my question. And so I turned around, and I said, I parked lawfully, which I did. He goes, yeah, I know your children are here, but it's a criminal offense if you refuse to answer my questions. I'm like, I did answer your question. You just don't like the answer. I'm walking away and I turned to start to watch, sir, you can't. And so the whole time his partner's laughing, you know, cause he knows what this guy's doing. He was a little older. He was not armed. He was wearing a cute little uniform. I'll give him that. He looked a little bit like a boy scout. And so my wife intervened, thank goodness, and said, look, sir, we parked in a parking lot. He's not answering you right now because you were a jerk to us when we, when we first pulled up. And that's when he started to backtrack and I was already walking, you know, into the park. That was probably the, I, I'll freely admit, it's probably the wrong way to handle it. Um, so no matter what, you're not going to have all the information that this law enforcement officer has and is making decisions off of. Uh, for example, you can be out in public and carrying a firearm and, and not know that people are eyeballing you or pointing it out or calling 911 about you. And all of a sudden you're walking out of a place and you, you know, you see five or six police officers and they point at you and then talk to each other and then they start walking towards you. So how does, how does a person in Georgia conduct themselves? Well, Georgia is different than many, many other states. Uh, thankfully for good reasons in the state of georgia law enforcement officers cannot detain someone just to find out if they have a weapons license so it's actually violation of the law illegal for cops to do that uh but it's completely legal for cops to detain you for something else that second tier detention that we talked about earlier so in terms of coming up with a strategy for dealing with law enforcement officers. I think that the primary strategy is to choose your words and behaviors in a way that makes it impossible for anyone to describe you as dangerous. Because if you say or do anything 
that the video of this encounter or that law enforcement officer's testimony later in court, which will be according to their own recollection, can describe you as being dangerous, you're going to make your lawyer's job difficult. That's true. That's very mm -hmm. true. I, mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, I, to, to allude to a point that you had earlier, you, after you arrest someone, you very seldom Mirandize them, correct? Yeah, at that point, uh, uh, we don't need to investigate anymore. I got the probable plus, cause, the arrest has been made, and there we go. Plus, anything they say at this point is completely admissible because you haven't asked them a question. Yeah. Uh, Jesse, well, well, Jesse and Lana, jump in on this for me uh, here. What do you tell people the best way is to interact with law? Because uh, invariably, this is going to happen is someone's going to see your gun at McDonald's, they're going to freak out. You're going to be walking away, and they've already alerted the officer who's having a cup of coffee in the corner. What do you tell folks to say or do to defuse this situation? Jesse, how do you handle it? Uh, well, I'll be honest. My biggest, ex my most experience as far as dealing with uh, officers and and when I'm carrying is uh, when I'm driving. I actually get pulled over a lot. Um, I, I got pulled over on my wedding day. Um, I got pulled over on the day my kids ultrasound. Um, so yeah. Uh, Were you late? Yeah, I was running late. <laughs> That's my fault. Yeah, poor poor uh, time management on my fault on my part. But um, but yeah. Uh, you know, the nice thing is, is that. While it's not required by law here in, in Florida or, or in Georgia, um, I, I typically get a lot more uh, leniency when I'm, I'm sorry, sir, just want you to know, I want, want you to know I have my concealed carry license and then I turn and I smile. That's why I would tell them the key is, if you're gonna tell them you have your concealed carry license, you smile at the same time, all right? So um, I smile, I tell them I have my concealed carry license, I, I don't get anything out at that point, and then uh, I usually let them them lead the stop. So I come right out, tell them I have the license. Then all of a sudden, the the stop or whatever is no longer about uh, my lead foot. Now it's about my concealed carry license. So uh, that's my biggest experience as far as dealing with officers while I'm carrying. Um, as far as what I educate my students on for um, dealing with law enforcement after. I actually had to use force or use self-defense, uh, that I, I will turn over to you, Lana. So I've got just a really funny story because this is just really funny. So I was leaving um, a class that I had just got through teaching in Colorado at an undisclosed range. And I am driving down I-25 and I am pulled over by a deputy sheriff in an undisclosed county. And he walks to my window and says, do you have a gun in the car? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. So I just answered his question and he says, well, where is it? And I said, well, it's, there's one on me. There's one in my middle console, one in my glove box, four in my range bag and three ARs in my trunk. And right then he said, could you please just leave your hands on the steering wheel? And I said, absolutely not a problem. So you don't shoot me, I don't yes. shoot you. <laughs> You just stay right where you're at. But what was funny was he probably just thought maybe I had a gun in the car. I had a Glock sticker on my car, um, which I don't do anymore. So I would recommend um, if you're a, a advocate to whatever Second Amendment, you know, don't tread on me. I'm, I'm all about that 100%. I just wouldn't put anything on your car that states that. It's just a a safety thing and that's the instructor coming out on me is it your right absolutely do whatever you want um but is it smart no um when you've had to encounter law enforcement after you've had to maybe stop a threat um and that's the language i would i would use right if you've had to use force to stop the threat the first thing i would do is call 911 you want to get the good guys rolling you want to get them coming um, to your direction. Um, when they're coming, you just want to be as 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 bare as possible on the 911 call, name, where you're at, what you look like. Um, and, you know, you need police, fire, ambulance, who you need, and then kind of be done. Um, I'm going to wait 
uh, this is where my rights take over. Um, where I'm basically going to say to law enforcement, I want to comply 100%, like I really do. Um, thank you for doing what you're doing, but I need my, my counsel. Um, that's what I would do. I would stand on my fourth, fifth, sixth, and eighth amendments and, and learn to, to shut up. And Matt, to take your line away from you, um, most people have the right to remain silent, but do they have the ability? So what I would like to say is not everybody does. And especially if you're a law abiding citizen and you did nothing wrong, um, then definitely if you did nothing wrong, you want to talk to your, your, um, your counsel. And that's where I would, that's what, how I would encounter law enforcement, both sides. I think that's, that's very good, uh, good advice. You know, jumping on a little bit of what Mike and then Jesse and, and Lana said, you don't have to let a police officer know that you have a firearm in Georgia. There's no law that requires it. As a matter of fact, I believe Georgia is one of only two states that have no affirmative duty to inform a law enforcement officer if in a stop, a traffic stop, for instance. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no law that requires you to say, I have a gun. There's no law that requires you to present a weapons carry license. Remember, you don't need one in your car if you're lawful to possess in your car. So the question becomes, what do you say and how do you say it? Well, to borrow a leaf of Mike's book, and I've heard Mike speak on this so frequently, I know what he's going to say. If that firearm is not going to become a central issue in a traffic stop, there's no need for you to make it a central issue in that traffic stop. You don't have to let them know that it's in the glove box or that it's in a box behind the seat where it needs to stay because you're driving on a school property and parking later on. Uh, now, if you're carrying strong side, you know, on your waistband and that's where your wallet is, you definitely want to let, you, you want to say, look, I, I just want to let you know, I have my hands at 10 and 2, I, I'm wearing a firearm right now and it's right next to my wallet. You tell me what you want me to do, because it may not be the guy that you're speaking to on the driver's side who gets freaked by seeing the gun. It may be the one you're not paying attention to on the passenger side of the car who ends up shooting you. And that happens all too frequently. You know, these officers may say, well, sir, I'm going to ask you to step out of the car. I'm, I'm going to remove your weapon. Uh, they may ask you to do a lot of different things. They may say, well, look, it's OK. I've got all the information that I need through my mobile data, data terminal, so it's not a problem. If that officer says, sir, will you hand that gun to me? Mike, what do you tell him? Yeah, so I'll definitely get to that. One thing I'd, I'd like to put across to everybody is that traffic stops uh, are part of the job of policing. Uh, and the best way that I can describe it is just imagine that your job is rolling dice. And if you roll a one, you get something cool. Everything's wonderful. Good job. You rolled a one. If you roll two, three, four or five, hey, you just get to roll the dice again. And if you roll a six, then someone pops out of a bush and you're in a fight for your life. Just imagine that that's your job. So in the, in the field where I was assigned uh, from 2015 to the end of 2017, about one out of every five people that I pulled over went to jail because they were wanted or because they had a suspended license. So about one out of every five or six people I pulled over ended up being physically arrested. Their vehicle was towed, uh, their vehicle was searched, they were inventoried, and there was a moment where we're standing on the side of a roadway where cars are traveling past us, where I don't know what this person's going to do. So with that in mind, you have to understand that this officer doesn't know you at all. And this officer is the sum of their career-long experiences. You're going to see a lot of different personalities among law enforcement officers. I like to joke that there's three of them and they'll all respond differently to a legally armed person who gives them that ball that Matt was just talking about. Uh, you'll have one of them that knows the law. They know the boundaries of their authority and they say something to the effect of, hey, that's fine. I think everybody should have a gun. This is about your taillight. Uh, you know, just give me your driver's license and we'll go from there. Um, then you'll run into a second type that's, that's more of improvising. Uh, well, uh, uh, I got a gun too. Uh, you don't pull yours, I ain't gonna pull mine. Uh, and then you've got a third one that is going to overexert their authority, and they're going to say what Matt just preempted this with, 
let me have your gun. Give me your gun. I want your gun. Is it okay if I have your gun? Now, what advice would I give to somebody in that position? Uh, the best way that I found to put this is that you need to comply, but not consent. Comply, but don't consent. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that if you're given an order, you need to go along with it. Because if you don't and you tell a cop no, you're, well, it's, it's going to get ugly really fast. Uh, but if an officer is asking for something, that's different. So how would I do it? Officer walks up to me and I say, hey, look, man, I just want to let you know I've got a valid Georgia driver's license. It's in my left pocket. Um, but I am no danger to you at all, but I'm legally carrying a gun. What would you like me to do? And the officer says, well, I want to hang on to that for my safety and yours. So keep your hands on the wheel. I'm going to reach across you. And how does this holster work? Uh, which is a line out of a police officer stopping a guy in Cobb County, Georgia in 2009, pointed the, the officer pointed his gun at the uh, driver's face, ordered him out of the vehicle. And then the next line was, how does this holster work? To which the driver should have said, would you like me to show you or explain it? I, you know, it's, uh, anyway, what would, what would my line be to comply, but not consent? It would sound something like, hey, whoa, man, that sounds really unsafe and dangerous. Um, I don't want either one of us pulling guns out. Uh, I'm really not cool with that. But I'm not going to argue with you and I'm not going to fight with you because I'm no danger to you at all. Again, every one of your actions and your words has to, has to reflect the idea that you're not dangerous. And hopefully, again, when uh, the jury might watch this video. And if your luck is anything like mine, your jury will be entirely comprised of people from San Francisco and Denver and New York City and uh, New Jersey. And um, yeah, that's, that's my luck. Um, so it, it centers around complying, but not giving up consent. If that cop says, hey, do you mind if I hang on to your gun? And you say, okay then what did you just do with your second amendment rights threw them out the window exactly and you can't get them back that's no no that barn door's open it's you know the cow's already out uh i think we're getting close to seven o'clock so it may be time to to wrap it up that's a lot of ground to cover uh, you guys have done a fantastic job jesse you want to give us any parting shots uh, you know, it's funny that Mike said that. I've literally had that exact thing happen to me. Uh, two Florida Highway Patrolmen. Um, uh, the, there was a rookie on a ride along. He was the one sent to my window, and uh, I was actually driving a buddy's car. His tag was expired. He had a legal tint, and exact same thing. He's like, "All right, well, let me have the gun," and I'm like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa!" So he was on the passenger side. I made him come around the other side, and, and I leaned forward, lean. And then he, he took the gun off. So um, I, I second what Mike said. Same exact thing. Uh, I want to comply, but uh, uh, not. There's no know. way I'm touching this gun. No, no, no. Not with the other guy back there looking at me. <laughs> I'm not pointing a gun at you. Yeah. Well, uh, folks, I want you to find Jesse online. Go to on Facebook. Go to Women Protection Services. He he runs a fantastic course. And as soon as we are out from under these uh, stay at home orders. He's gonna start running some courses back up here in Georgia. So please Good. be sure and check him out. Uh, Lana, uh, Mariana, I'm sorry. I, we, I, I didn't mean to neglect you guys. Any parting shots uh, for, the, for the group? Uh, nothing for me, but we do have some questions that people have asked during our webcast. Um, okay. I don't know if we have time to address those now or if you wanna grab those in the after party with everyone. All right, why don't we do this? Uh, we'll take those questions, we'll answer them in the after party, and then we'll do a follow-up video that we'll post on uh, Facebook so that we can make sure we got all those answers. I wanted to all tell right. people, um, I, I, if you don't mind, I wanted to tell people about how to sign up for US Law Shield. Um, it's really important to get US Law Shield for all of those that are listening right now that do not have, it, do are that are not members. We are living in uncertain times, and because of that, we don't know what's going to happen day to day. And you might be you know, self-quarantining at home. You might be braving the streets and running out into Walmart, which don't do it. 
Um, I did it today and I'm telling you what, <laughs> I've never, I could not believe what I saw with my own eyes at Walmart. This is why I don't shop at Walmart. Um, the case. And Jesse, I'm, Jesse, I'm not kidding. I haven't gone to Walmart in six months. I went to Walmart today and had to literally just leave. Um, it was it was that bad. So to sign up for US Law Shield, I'm going to throw a special on for everybody today. Um, I have some gunshot wound certification courses that you can take online. This is a $60 value. If you sign up for US Law Shield, I will actually mail you your certificate um, to give you one of those for free. Um, just make sure that you call me and sign up through me. I cannot give it to you if you sign up online. So call me, my phone number, 719-287-8890. My email address, l4 at uslawshield.com. Fantastic. Well, Mariana, you're going to take us right into an after party when we're done here, right? That's right. Yes. All right, yeah, we'll, we're just we'll get... going to do a little, um, we've been doing the webcast now where you get to hear all of us give our opinions. The after party is an opportunity for everyone to get on camera if they want to themselves, and we can talk back and forth. So everyone's welcome to join that, and I'll be popping the link up um, as soon as we wrap up here. Fantastic. Well, everyone, thanks so much for joining us. I've had a great time doing this. I appreciate all of our panelists being here. Uh, we are planning already for next week. Next week's going to be Gunsmith Appreciation Week. Uh, we're going to have a Glock Armorer from Smyrna, Georgia on. We're going to have a Gunsmith Specialist from Holly Springs, and we're going to have a Gunsmith Specialist from South Carolina all join us to talk about modifications to firearms, some of the things they've seen, what new gun owners are, are asking to have done to their firearms, some do's, some don'ts, some maybes. I'm going to have some great photos to throw up some stuff that uh, one of the guys has done for some, some work for me. Uh, we'll answer a lot of questions. Hopefully we'll make Bruce Greenfield happy. He's had, he's been texting me this entire episode. Um, we got a lot to talk about. There's a lot of great news out there. We can cover some of the great gun news in our after party. Hope to see you all there. Thanks for joining us tonight. Next Friday night at 5.56 p.m. Hope to see you there. Good night, everybody. Good night. I'll pop the link up now. <laughs>